1793, noted French scientist Joseph Dombe departed La Havre, France, bound for Philadelphia. His mission was to meet with Thomas Jefferson and give him two of the rarest items on Earth. Unfortunately for Dombe, fate had other intentions, and storms pushed the ship he was aboard well off course. And so it was that around the time he was supposed to deliver his precious cargo to Jefferson, he found himself instead at the mercy of British pirates. Being French in this situation, not exactly ideal, so at first he attempted to pass himself off as Spanish, but his accent gave him away. Dombe was eventually taken to the small Caribbean island of Montserrat, where he ultimately died before he could be ransomed. So, well, what was the precious cargo that he had decided to deliver as a gift to the United States? Well, this was two small copper items, of which only six sets existed on Earth at the time. They were standards that represented a meter and a grave, the latter being better known today as a kilogram. At the time, the United States, having already become one of the first nations in the world to adopt a decimal base 10 system for currency, was strongly considering doing the same for their system of weights and measures. The idea was to get rid of the mix of British weights and measures that were mixed with other systems that were commonly used throughout the young nation. Thus, with the initial strong support of then Secretary of State Thomas Jefferson, and thanks to a desire to continue to strengthen ties between France and the United States, adoption of the new French metric system seemed rather close at hand. Along with a trade agreement concerning grain export to France, Dombe was to deliver the meter and grave standards and attempt to argue the system's merits to Congress, who at the time were quite open to adopting these units of measure. Of course, we all know how this turned out. Don Bade never got a chance to make his arguments, thanks to concerns about whether the metric system would stick around at all in France, combined with the fact that trade between Britain and the US would be hindered by such a change, the US eventually decided to abandon efforts to adopt the metric system, and mostly just stuck with the British system, though the US customary units and what would become the imperial system would soon diverge in the following decades. But as more and more nations came to adopt this new system of weights and measures, the US slowly began to follow suit. Fast forwarding to 1866, and with the Metric Act, the US officially sanctioned the use of the metric system in all contracts, dealings, or court proceedings, and provided each state with standard metric weights and measures. In 1876, the United States was one of just 17 nations to sign the Treaty of the Meter, establishing, among other things, the International Bureau of Weights and Measure to govern this system. Fast forward to a little under a century later, and the full switch seemed inevitable in the United States after the 1968 Metric Study Act. This ended up being a three-year study looking at the feasibility of switching the United States to the metric system. The result? Well, that was a report titled A Metric America, A Decision Whose Time Has Come. This recommended that the change should take place and said that it could be done in as little as 10 years. Unfortunately, the public was largely either apathetic or strongly opposed to making the switch. According to a Gallup poll at the time, 45% were against it. This was nothing new, however. A huge percentage of the time that a given people of a nation have been asked by their government to switch to the international system of units, the general public of those nations were largely against it. Even France itself, who went back and forth for decades on the issue. Indeed, it was this going back and forth that contributed to the United States' hesitation to adopt the system in the early going. Brazil actually experienced a genuine uprising when the government forced the change in the late 19th century. Over half a century later, British citizens still stubbornly cling to many of the old measurements in their day-to-day -day lives, though they've otherwise adopted SI units. So why did all of these governments frequently go against the will of their people? Well, arguments for the economic benefit simply won out. As in so many matters of government, what businesses want, businesses often get. So the governments ignored the will of the general public, and they did it anyway. But in the US, the situation was different. Not having the pressure from being bordered and economically as bound to one's neighbors as in Europe and being one of the world's foremost economic powerhouses itself, the immediate economic benefit it didn't seem so clear. For example, California alone, one of 50 states, if it was its own nation, would have the fifth largest economy in the world. Texas and New York State aren't far behind when compared to nations of the world's economies at 10th and 13th place respectively, let alone the other 47 states. Seeing lesser readily apparent economic benefit and not having the same geographic pressures as in Europe, in the 1970s many big businesses and unions were in strong opposition to the change, citing the cost of making the switch, and on the latter side unions worried that such a change would make it easier to move jobs that formerly used customary units overseas, given that now such product could be more easily purchased from abroad. 
Swayed when the 1975 Metric Conversion Act was signed by President Gerald Ford, it had largely lost its teeth. While it did establish a board whose job it was to facilitate the nation's conversion and put forth various recommendations, the act did not have an official timeline, and the switch was voluntary. Nevertheless, contrary to popular belief, in the decades since, the United States actually has largely switched the metric system, just the general public, both domestic and international, seem largely ignorant of this. The US military almost exclusively uses the metric system. Since the early 1990s, the federal government has largely been converted, and the majority of big businesses have made the switch in one form or another wherever possible. In fact, with the passage of the Metric Conversion Act of 1988, the metric system became the preferred system of weights and measures for United States trade and commerce. In the medical field and pharmaceuticals, the metric system is also used almost exclusively. In fact, since the Mendenhall Order of 1893, even the units of measure used by the layperson in the US, the yard, foot, inch, and pound, have all been officially defined by the meter and the kilogram. Speaking of the general public side, nobody in the US blinks an eye about food labels containing both metric and customary units required thanks to the Fair Packaging and Labeling Act, with the majority of states since also allowing metric only. The gram is commonly used to measure everything from the amount of flour to add into a recipe to how much marijuana one buys from a shop or, where it's still illegal, their local dealer. And if you were to ask someone to pick you up a two liter of Dr. Pepper or how a person did running a 10K, most everyone in the US would know exactly what you're talking about. Beyond this, you'd be hard-pressed to find a ruler in the United States that doesn't include both inches and centimeters and their common divisors. Further, in school, both customary units and the metric system are taught. Yes, while many Americans generally have little practical need to learn a second language, most are, at least for a time, reasonably fluent in two very different systems of measurement. As with languages unpracticed, however, once out of school, many lose their sense of the latter from lack of use and concrete perspective. It's one thing to know what a hundred and zero degrees Celsius refers to with respect to water, but it's a whole different thing to get what temperature you might want to put on a jacket for. However, students who go on to more advanced science classes quickly pick up this perspective as they become more familiar, and thus the scientists of America aren't at the slightest disadvantage here. All students that go along that path become just as familiar as their European brethren, if just a little later in life. So this all brings us around to why the United States hasn't made the switch to the metric system more official than it already is. Well, primarily there are three reasons. Cost, human psychology, and, at least on the general public side, little readily apparent practical reason to do so. As to cost, while there has never been a definitive study showing how much it would cost the United States to make the switch official and universal, general estimates range even upwards of a trillion dollars, all things considered. Why so high? Well, to begin with, we'll discuss a relatively small example in road signs. Installing street signs is an incredibly expensive affair in many places for a variety of reasons. For instance, in 2011, the Washington State Department of Transportation claimed it costs anywhere from $30,000 to $75,000 per sign, though they later clarified that those were the worst case and most expensive scenarios, and sometimes the signs and installation can only ring in at around $10,000. Bronley Mischler of The Dot explains, Installing a sign along a highway isn't quite as simple as pounding some posts into a ground and bolting a sign to it. That's why the costs are so variable. There are two ways to replace a sign. One way allows us to uninstall it under old rules. The second way requires us to follow new federal standards. The old rules apply if we are just fixing something, not building something new. Installing a new sign along the road counts as fixing something, basically just giving drivers more information. If we install a sign on the side of the road, it would cost $2,000 to make the sign, buy the beams and rivets, $8,000 for two steel poles and concrete, $5,000 to clear brush and other landscape work before and after installation, $15,000 for maintenance crews to set up traffic cones, work vehicles, program highway signs, and spend the evening doing the work. Total, $30,000. The new rules apply if we are doing a new construction project. Costs would be higher because we would have to bring everything up to the current highway code. These often involve putting up a sign bridge, a steel structure that spans the entire freeway to hold up multiple signs. Typical costs include $2,600 to make the sign, buy the beams and rivets because the sign must be bigger, $75,000 for the sign bridge, for a total of $77,600. WS. Deputy Regional Administrator Bill Vleck also stated, Beyond many of these signs needing to be special ordered on a one-off variety, think a highway sign with a city name on it and a distance marker, and them often being much larger than most sign makers make, drastically increases the cost. 
Further, there are sometimes special features that increase the cost of the sign, and we don't really know about them. For instance, Vlex states that if there's an auto accident, if a car hits that signpost, and there's any kind of injury involved, the state is going to be liable. So we're looking potentially at a multi-million dollar settlement in those kinds of situations. So it would have to be a breakaway type signpost, and it has to be specially fabricated so that if a car hits that sign, it reacts appropriately and doesn't come down and basically take out the occupants. For your reference here, in 1995 it was estimated that approximately 6 million signs would need to be changed on federal and state roads. On top of that, it was noted that approximately just shy of 3 million of the nation's about 4.2 million miles, that's 6.8 million kilometers of public roads, are actually local, with an uncertain number of signs in those regions that would need to be changed. That said, the rather obscene costs quoted by the aforementioned Washington State DOT would likely be grossly overestimated on a project such as this, with prices massively reduced if special laws were passed to remove much of the red tape, and given the extreme bulk orders that would be called for here, including for the signs themselves and contracts to dedicated crews to make this happen as fast as possible. For example, in 1995, Alabama estimated that they could swap out all of the signs on federal highways for a mere $70 per sign, which is $120 in today's money, on average. Perhaps a better rubric would be looking at Canada's switch, swapping out around a quarter of a million signs on their 300,000 miles, that's 482,000 kilometers, of road. The total reported cost? Only a little over $13 million, which is about $61 million today, or around $244 per sign in today's dollars. Extrapolating that out to the minimum 6 million signs, that would then cost approximately $1.5 billion, plus whatever additional signs needed to be swapped out on the three quarters of all the rest of the roads that are not accounted for in that 6 million sign estimate. Not an insignificant sum, but also relatively trivial for the US taxpayer to cover at about $5 per person, plus some uncertain amounts for the local Local road signs that need to be changed. Moving on to far greater expenses, industry and wider infrastructure. While it's impossible to accurately estimate the cost of such a change to American businesses as a whole, we do get a small glimpse of the issue when looking at a NASA report studying the feasibility of swapping the shuttle program to full metric. They determined the price tag would be a whopping $370 million for that project alone at the time, so decided it wasn't worth the cost for little practical benefit. Now extrapolate that out to approximately 28 million businesses in the United States, their software their records, their labels, their machinery, employee training, etc. Needing switching would be like some sort of Y2K event, but on steroids. Therefore, while it's not really possible to tell for sure, many estimate that it could swell into the region of hundreds of billions of dollars and maybe even into the trillion territory. At this point, even the most ardent supporter of the metric system in the United States may be rethinking whether it'd be worth it to make the switch more official than it already is. But do not fret metric supporters the world over. To begin with, the raw cost of making the switch doesn't actually tell the whole story here. In fact, it tells a false story. While the gross total of making the change would be astronomical, it turns out the net cost likely wouldn't be much or anything at all. For example, average Australian businesses saw a 9 to 14% boost directly attributed to the switch when they made it. Back in the United States, when companies like IBM, GM, Ford, and others spent the money to make the change, they universally found that they made a profit doing this. This was largely from being able to reduce warehouse space, equipment needs, streamline production, lower necessary inventories, as well as taking the opportunity to, at the same time, remove inefficiencies that had crept into their respective businesses with regard to these systems. They were also able to more uniform formally manage their businesses abroad and domestic to the same standards and systems. As a very small example, GM reported they were able to reduce its number of fan belts that they had to manufacture and stock from about 900 sizes to 100, thanks to everything that went with the switch. In some cases, the businesses also noted new international markets opening up, both in sales and ability to more easily and often more cheaply acquire products abroad. All of this resulted in a net profit extremely quickly from investing the money into making the switch. As you might expect, expect from these types of benefits, an estimated 30% of businesses in the United States have largely already switched to metric. Granted, these are generally large companies and various small businesses dealing locally might not see such a benefit. However, with the increasing globalization of supply chains, many small businesses would likely still see some benefit. Unfortunately, particularly when it comes to construction, that general industry has lagged well behind others in switching. And as you might imagine, the existing infrastructure of the nation, from roads to bridges to homes to drill bits to screen 
screws to the architectural plans for all of it being based on customary units would not be cheap to change and it isn't clear what the cost would be. However, as in all of this, the cost could potentially be mitigated via a slow phase-out approach with grandfathering allowed, similar to what other nations did, though in most cases on a vastly smaller scale than would be seen in the United States. So this brings us around to the human side of the argument. To begin with, while the United States would unequivocally see many benefits to joining the rest of the world in some good old-fashioned metric lovin', as you might expect given the lack of immediately obvious benefits to the layperson, few among the American public see much point. After all, what does it really matter if a road sign is in kilometers or miles, or if one's house is measured in square feet or square meters? While some cite the benefits of ease of conversion to other units in a given system in day-to-day -day life, this is almost never a thing that's cumbersome in the slightest. If it was, Americans would be clamoring to make the change. The argument that ease of conversion between the units should be a primary driver for the public to want the change simply doesn't hold water in an era where, on the extremely rare occasion people actually need to make such a precise conversion in day-to-day -day life, they have little more than to say, hey Google. And in most cases, even that isn't necessary when you're reasonably familiar with a given system. Perhaps a poignant example of how, when you're familiar, a non-base 10 system of measure really isn't that complicated to deal with in day-to-day -day matters, consider that the world still uses 1000 milliseconds in a second, 60 seconds in a minute, 60 minutes in an hour, and 24 hours in a day. What few people realize about this is that the original metric system actually attempted to simplify this as well, dividing the day into 10 hours with 100 minutes in each hour. Unfortunately, most people didn't see the benefit in switching when also factoring in having to swap out their existing clocks. Nobody has much seen a need to fix the issue since not even the most ardent champion of the metric system for its ease of conversions compared with imperial or customary units. And while you might still be lamenting the stubbornness of Americans for not seeing the genuine benefits to themselves that would likely be realized here, we should point out that virtually every nation in the world that uses the metric system has holdover units still relatively commonly used among laypeople that aren't metric, for simple reasons of not seeing a reason to stop, from calories to horsepower to knots to light years and many more. Or how about if you've ever flown in a plane almost anywhere in the world? Well, congratulations, you've in all likelihood unwittingly been supporting the use of something other than the metric system. You see, the pilots aboard from French to American use a feet-based flight level system for their altitude and knots to measure their speed. Just two standards that, much like the American public and their road signs, nobody has seen much practical reason to change. Now to more concrete human psychology for not making the switch, which has gradually been converting more and more Americans from general apathy to the anti-switch crowd as the decades pass. When one group of humans tells another what to do, occasionally using terms like idiot units and starting flame wars in comments of every website or video posted on the web that uses or discusses said units, you will universally get resistance, if not outright hostility in response. This is not an American thing, as so often purported, this is a human thing.